I'd like to welcome everyone. You are joining a Bible study at the Market Street Presbyterian Church. We are located at 1100 West Market Street in Lima, Ohio. And our Bible studies are held on Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. You're more than welcome to come to Bible study, Sunday service, which is held at 10.30 a.m. Sunday morning, or any event or activity or program that we have here at Marcus Street Presbyterian Church. We'd love to see you. So tonight we're going to be in Genesis chapter number 28 for Bible study, and I'm going to uh, open us up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, take us back to these events that happened long ago, but yet have been recorded through Moses in the book of Genesis. And we would like to acknowledge that the Holy Scriptures are the living word of a living God. And the scriptures cannot be broken, no matter what uh, is thrown at the Bible to attack it, it will stand as the word of the Lord, today, tomorrow, and forever. So help us to learn from this, your word, and help us to grow in and through your word, that your name might be glorified, and the saints who are participating in this study are edified. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we currently have three online and two here at the church. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter number 28. And whatever uh, version of scripture you have is fine. And I'm going to ask for readers here at the church. And I will see if I have a reader for Genesis 28 verses 1 and 2. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Pandan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Leban, thy mother's brother. Okay, I'm going to begin with a little bit of a homemade cartoon on the board. Now, I'm not a cartoonist and I'm not an artist. <laughs> so please don't leave comments in the comment section. <laughs> no more cartoons or whatever. I fully acknowledge that I'm not the one that could be employed in a newspaper uh, making cartoons. However, I wanted to put this on the board because I think it gets us right into the text and gets us right into the narrative. Okay, so you can see I got two characters on the board. Now the one here is Esau. Remember when we last left Esau, he had a burning passion inside of him. And the burning passion was, I'm going to kill you, bro. <laughs> now Jacob is going to get some instructions from his parents 
to please do not take a wife from among the Canaanites. And remember that this was the very instruction that Isaac had. And he went back to the land, his homeland, and found Rebekah. So he wants Jacob to do the same. Now, if we could rephrase it, I will rephrase it like this. Jacob, do not get an ungodly wife. Jacob, do not get a wife who is under the influence of false gods. Jacob, do not get an immoral wife who has no sense of morality and no sense of right or wrong. Therefore, you've got to go back to that land where I found my precious bride, Rebecca. So in this little cartoon, by the way, you won't find this in any uh, comic book or any book. I made it up myself, all right? It's an original and you can, you can, um, you can tell me it's not so great, I don't care. But I wanted to get you right into the text that you've got somebody who's pushing forward and that's Jacob. And then you've got somebody kind of telling him uh, in life with a, with a really bad motive. Remember, he's still hot. He's still, he's still uh, upset with his brother, even though he shouldn't be, but he is, okay? So Jacob's on his way to find himself a godly wife, okay? So the next thing we're going to see here is a reaffirmation of the covenant, okay? A reaffirmation. In other words, God made his promises to, you know what, it might be a good time to put this on the board too, because this is kind of, uh, Kind of interesting. Ah, here we are. <laughs> I had to find it in my notes. <laughs> okay, the patriarchs. We have Abraham, and you have Isaac, and then you have Jacob. Now remember, all of these are gonna share in one thing, the covenant, C-O-V, covenant. I didn't spell it out, all right? The covenant goes down. And by the way, it's going to keep going. All right. But these are the major figures. And in biblical history, they're referred to as the patriarchs, the patriarchs of the faith in the history of Judaism. Okay. So you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, each one, there's a certain key word. And the key word that they are assigning to uh, Abraham is authority. In other words, he's the first one. God calls Abram of the Or of Chaldees. And it's just, this is who God chooses. And we're into the sovereignty of God on that one, by the way. Um, don't ask me to explain it to you because it can't. God just chooses, period. I'm not going to get into any, oh, I think I know why he chose Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. And I'm not going to get into the idea of, oh, I think I know why he chose me. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get into that at all because there was no real good reason to do so. Right? Now, 
authority for Abraham, right? So then Isaac becomes, we'll use the word submission. So remember the outplay on, the, on uh, Moriah, where uh, uh, Isaac is to go to the mountain with his father, and he's literally become a sacrifice. And father's like this, and the angel stops him. No, no, no. So Isaac is a submissive one. In fact, Isaac is a representative of, of Jesus because he's on the altar to be slain. So he's submissive. So that leads us to Jacob, where we're at in our little narrative here. Who is Jacob in this patriarchal? And what's sort of the one word that we might use for Jacob is struggle. And by the way, that word uh, actually uh, comes out of his birth. He was the one that was struggling, and he was the one that was going after the heel of his brother, Esau, who was born first, Esau. But Jacob is the one who struggles. Now, there's more to be said about each one of them, okay? But this is just sort of one word assigned to each patriarch as you travel this journey in the book of Genesis. So Jacob's life is going to have a lot of struggles. Now, you might want to say something like, Oh, that's good because I've got some struggles too. So you might want to tag along a little bit with Jacob and say, well, what kind of struggles do you have? Now we'll get a fresh board up here. I like to write rather big so you can see it. Um, when I do something and it comes across on the screen so that you can see it and you can take note of it. <laughs> All right, so we are now into the renewal of the covenant that's going to be passed from Abraham to Isaac uh, to Jacob. So we're going to look at that, and that would be in verse number three up through verse number uh, five, I guess. Three through five. So again, do I have a reader here at the church? Sure. Hmm. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and numerous that you may become a company of peoples. May he give to you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, land that God gave to Abraham. And thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, and the Armenian, and the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. All right, thank you.
technical. So please pardon us for just a moment. I think we're okay now. All right, thank you, Diane, whatever it was. Okay, so El Shaddai, God, all powerful. Now, why is it important to use that particular uh, phraseology or title for God in the Hebrew language? Because there's different ways of expressing God, okay? Uh, and in this, this particular title, it expresses his might and his power, okay? So if you look at the covenant, what God promises to do, he promises to do some really outstanding things. And you might also want to say, well, mighty things or big things. Maybe that would be a better way to put it. He plans to do some really big things. Now, what are the big things that he says he will do in this covenant that originally started with Abraham or Abram? What are the things that he said he would do? So I'll kind of open that up here at the church to see if I got any, any responses. Just take a close look at it. He's going to give the blessing of Abraham. Right, right. The blessing that originally came with Abraham. Okay. And then remember what that all included. Okay, that included a, a large number of people, right? And it also included a land. Now remember, the land isn't really theirs yet, okay? That's not going to happen for quite some time. It will happen under the efforts of Joshua. Okay, Joshua will clear the land, so to speak, and allow the Israelites to come in and fully settle in the land. Right now, it's basically just a promise. So it's a pretty big, large promise to make. And Moses, in his, in his wisdom, as he's under the spirit, under the influence of, under the power of the Holy Spirit will select the title El Shaddai, God all powerful, okay? Because if you look at what the promises are, you'd say, well, I don't know about, about this sort of thing. Uh, this God better be mighty and greater than any of these other gods around here, okay? And that's exactly what that title is. All powerful, almighty, okay? So we have it established that the covenant is going to go down through the line, the holy seed from Abraham to Isaac uh, to Jacob. All right, let me stop and see if I have any questions before we get into the next section. Any questions on anything that I covered so far? All right. So what we're gonna do is go on to the next uh, section. And that section will begin at verse number six. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram and take a wife there, and that he blessed him and he charged him, you shall not marry one of the Canaanite women. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Padan Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please his father Isaac, Esau went to Ishmael and took Makala, the daughter of Abraham's 
son Ishmael and sister of Nehemiah to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. Now, I don't know if you ever in your family life, whether growing up as a child or perhaps after you had family and have had children or still have children in the household, we all can probably relate some story to the topic of sibling rivalry. Who's going to be the best one? Who's going to get the most favor of mom and dad? Who's going to be the most successful? And these things, uh, these, these, these types of questions plague brother, sister, 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 brother, brother. <laughs> and uh, it's a very, very real thing in today's world. But it's also, it was also a very real thing, I think, in the days of Bible. So here we have Esau, who kind of messed everything up, but yet in his mind and in his heart, he's kind of starting to maybe regret a little bit of what he did. And he's starting to think, you know, maybe I should try to score some points, maybe with mom and dad. Because currently, in, the, in this text, he already has two wives. And, and the wives are of the land of Canaan. They're Hittites, or basically we'll say they're not of the faith, not of the true faith. So Esau knows he's messed up in, 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 in a couple of different ways. Uh, we know he messed up with the birthright thing and all of that, but he also messed up in terms of marriage, that he married an unbelieving uh, wife or wives, plural. So now he kind of wants to smooth things over a little bit. And he's thinking, you know, maybe I should try to please mom and dad here. So he comes up with the scheme and the, and the whole idea, well, I'll go to uh, Ishmael's line, that is my father's brother, sort of, sort of stepbrother, um, and I'll see if I can find me a wife. <laughs> and indeed, that's what he does. Now, In one sense of the word, uh, the commentators on this particular topic will have a little bit of praise for Esau. But yet, in the same breath, they will say he falls short. Now, here's why they say that. Because he went to Ishmael's line. Now, this will sound a little funny, maybe, if you're a man, maybe if you're a lady, might have a little bit of a tiny bit of offense to you, but <laughs> the good women are not here. They're over there. The good women are not in this area. You got to go 500 miles from here if you want yourself a good woman. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that's kind of the general idea of it. And I try to dramatize things a little bit so you get it, all right? And I know maybe once in a while, how I present things might be a little rough for a little bit. But listen, that's just the way it was. The bad women <laughs> were in the land where they were. They were foreigners in a land. They were, they were, they were, uh, they were, they uh, were, People, in a sense, that really didn't belong there, okay? Not yet. They will later. But remember, the land hasn't been taken and everything like that. They're still in a very ungodly land. But the godly women are where? They're over yonder. 
put a little southern touch to. They're over yonder, all right? And over yonder is, well, a good 500 miles away, maybe 600, all right? Mm -hmm. And that, and remember back to my cartoon now, that's where Jacob's going, all right? <laughs> now Esau wanted it easy. So he didn't do that. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't go all the way with his plan. Now, like I say, the commentators will give you a little bit of like, well, this is, this is, this is okay. This is a little bit, little bit praiseworthy, but then they'll stop and say, oh no, it, don't give him too much praise, okay? Because he did not do as his mother and father would have wanted. Now, how do we know that? Well, first of all, that's how father got his wife. It was no easy journey for Isaac uh, to go all the way back to, um, to, the, to the homeland. He, he had a rough time getting, you know, traveling, getting there and everything. And it's no easy journey for Jacob either. Remember, we got that little word for Jacob, struggle. So here's Esau. He doesn't go all the way with it. So there's a little bit of grace there maybe for Esau, but it just doesn't really quite cut it. So let me do a little bit of sermonizing and preaching. Maybe I already have, all right? You know, that's just the way it is today, honestly. I mean, the world today does not want someone to say genuine Christianity is a full commitment. The world today wants people to say, well, you can, you can sort of be like Esau and just do a little bit and give a little bit to God. And, you know, and in a way, there's some praise to that. But if you want to know the real story, and you want to know what God really wants, he wants all of you. He doesn't want just a tiny wee bit. He doesn't want just a certain day. He doesn't want just a certain area. He wants you from head to toe. He wants your outside, your body, and he wants your inside. Now, it's just that simple, and that's not what people want to hear, all right? But Jacob went all the way. And Esau kind of went a little bit of the way. And that's kind of the difference there um, in this particular section that we're dealing with, okay? So let me stop right there and see if I have any reaction or comments or anything before we get into the next section. All right, I've got a little bit of, uh, of a silence here on this end. So we're gonna, we're gonna proceed on to the next section. And this, this is a real interesting section. And I think we'll take it to verse number 15, go from 10 uh, to 15. 10 to 15. Do I have a reading on that? And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abram, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land where thou liest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be, be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places, whether thou goest 
and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. All right, so we've got that Jacob, remember he was saying, I'm going to get a wife, and that's what he's doing right now. And he's going from Beersheba. To Haran. Now just going to put down here approximately 500. We'll throw an extra 100 in there, 600 miles. So this is his destination. Now he's probably just about, they estimate about 50 miles to two days journey, maybe about 20, 25 miles a day. It's hard to say. But anyhow, he's, and then he comes to a place and put the X there. Now later that's going to be called Bethel. But right now it's not called that in the text. Okay. So he, he finds his place to uh, rest on his journey and he wants to uh, get his body in a position of sleep and he wants to get a pillow. Now, there's no pillows available when you're traveling the wilderness, except for a stone. So it brings to my mind, these are just personal stories that I hope help keep the study a little more interesting. I, Hope you find some of the things I say interesting in my stories, but anyhow, uh, I had to, I made some travels myself to faraway land <clears throat> and was to spend many hours on jet travel. And my jet uh, was not to leave until early morning, but I had to arrive at night in an airport. And uh, I was not about to get a room somewhere. And back then, before a lot of this occurred, uh, it, you, you could kind of rest in an airport. <laughs> so I had to spend the night, I was tired, and I put my travel bag down on the floor and I used it for a pillow. <laughs> now I have to admit it wasn't the most comfortable thing, but I actually did fall asleep and I slept a few hours on the floor of an airport in New York City, by the way. And um, I had my travel bag as a pillow. Now I don't recommend it. And I'm not saying it was the best night of sleep, but I slept. So maybe you have a story similar to this, that just in a crude fashion, you get hold of something and use that for to lay your head down on. So so you got some way to rest your head. And so Jacob finds a stone that would have fit the purpose and he puts his head on the stone. Now, Jacob will go into a sort of dreamlike state and God will use this. And this is where it gets a little I have to be careful in what I say because I don't want to promote the idea that it's a good idea to say, God, speak to me in my dreams or speak to me in my sleep. Although I, want, I don't doubt it that it can happen, okay? Because it did happen with Joseph and others. Uh, Mar uh, Mary's Joseph, his father over the Christ child. Um, it did happen in Bible and can happen and perhaps has happened to you. But in this situation, it's Jacob on a stone and he goes into a state that uh, produces a vision of some sort. Now it's hard to classify all this and say, what exactly was it or whatever. So I'm just gonna use the word vision, dreamlike state, but, 
God inspired. Now that's the one thing because this is where I got to watch because I'm going to tell you now the devil will use dreams and things like that in a negative fashion for people and it can be misused and it is misused in the in the world of the satanic and the occult. But here in this biblical text, this man who is a godly man in the godly seed will be spoken to by a holy God through a dream. So I'm going to try now to outline something for you that may help you understand not just the text in Genesis, but may help you understand the whole Bible and perhaps even help you to understand all of life out there in terms of, of the visual and the not visual. The, the, there's, there's the world that, that you can see with your eyes, and then there's a whole world you cannot see with your eyes, okay? And most folks only live with what they can see with, with their eyes. And they don't want to even try to realize there's, there's a lot out there that's not seen with the human eye, all right? So we're going to, I'm going to try to help you with that, okay? Okay, that's you. And that's me. Okay, and this is the sun. And this is the moon. And these are the stars. Okay, so I'm not trying to make it too accurate, just to give you an idea. This is what you see with your eyes. Okay, and this is called the first heaven. Now, just to make this clear to you, I'm going to put dashes up here. as a line or marker, there is a second heaven. And as you might expect, there's a third heaven. Now you can find biblical reference for this um, in the, where Paul says, I know a man who's caught up into the third heaven. This is biblical now. This is not just, you know, me rambling, okay? All right, now the third heaven is where God dwells. And I'm gonna put here, uh, and the and the uh, saints triumphant. In other words, when you say uh, my loved one died and went to heaven, okay, that's the third heaven. That's Zion. That's where God dwells. Now, this second heaven is kind of an intermediary. And this second heaven, you can have good angels coming down through it, but it also is inhabited by fallen angels. And these are where the powers and principalities are that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6. So now when Jacob, well, let's put Jacob in there. This is Jacob. And he's just doing what you do. He sees the moon at night, sees the stars. When he dreams, he will get a ladder.
Okay. And he will see angels ascending and descending. And that ladder will connect the first, second, and third heaven. Now that's that's why this is a little hard to understand because it's a it's a gate of heaven. And that's exactly how it's going to be called in Holy Scripture here when we get to the end of this text. Okay. It's as if God is saying, there's more to life than what you see with your eyes. And once again, that's that's a problem for a lot of folks <coughs> because they can't go beyond the idea that the only thing to life is what you see with, with your eyes and touch with your hands. Now, I'm not saying uh, that, 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 that isn't a fact. That is a fact. What you see with your eyes and touch with your hands is there. However, there's more there than meets the eye, so to speak. Okay. And by the way, that's why Jesus said, he who has eyes, uh, let him, and he who has ears, let him hear, and then he who has eyes, let him see, okay? And that's why I think he was always healing the blind, because he's physically dramatizing the idea that there's more in existence than what you see with your eyes, okay? So this ladder will then be that whole idea of that bridge, or that uh, open gate, or that concept of, of earth and heaven. And of course, the intermediary uh, heaven, which is called the second heaven. And that is something that's, that's a place of combat. And, and, and that's a place where there's what, now the text seems to indicate just like good angels, but you got to understand something. There's one third of fallen angels hanging around somewhere, all right? And some of them uh, might be what we call the demons and evil spirits on earth. But, there, but Paul talks about these in Ephesians 6 in high places, okay? He talks about these. Now, what happens is from up in here in the second heavens, these things will influence down here. And that's why it's so hard. Um, I don't know how to put this. That's why no matter how hard you try, or I try, you want to change the world. You may make a little difference somewhere, but ultimately, the ones that really sort of run the show are up here, okay? Because they are the powers and principalities. Now, Jacob's ladder showed the angels ascending and descending, okay? And it didn't specify uh, the types of angels, but the assumption is they're all just good angels. But we know from New Testament that that second heavens also is a place of warfare. Now, Daniel also tells us too, because Daniel uh, prayed and an angel was to come and the angel said, I got delayed. My flight was delayed. What he meant was he couldn't get through the second heaven because see, they battle, they battle up there. And it's a little hard for people to understand. And it took me many years to understand it myself personally. But I believe it is absolutely true, and it is Bible that I'm giving you. Okay, um, so we're gonna we're gonna try to see now how Jesus will use this imagery. So so we're gonna stay it, it, using uh, the New Testament. We're gonna jump now to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, and then this will this will throw a little more on it for you. John, 
one, forty five to fifty one. John 1, 45 to 51, the Gospel of John in New Testament. Okay, so let me see if I have a reader here, and if not, I'll take it myself. Sure, I gave 45 to 51. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm trying to find out who my reader is. <laughs> Philip findeth Nathanael and saith to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said, Of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these, and saith unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. All right, basically I had that text read in John for the very last verse, and I will repeat it. And he added, I tell you the truth, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now that imagery, you can't deny it. It's, it's Jacob's ladder. <laughs> It's right from Genesis. I mean, it's just so clear. So basically, uh, Jesus is trying to say, if you really want to know how to get through the heavens, and you really want to know who's the one that comes from heaven to earth and earth to heaven, it's me, because I am the one that the angels will ascend on and descend on, the Son of Man. So Jacob's ladder, as it's called, is really Jesus. Okay, that's your New Testament interpretation of the Old Testament. Now, when do they ascend and descend on Jesus? Well, we saw some of it in his er earthly life, but a lot of scholars believe that this is a reference to when Jesus returns. In other words, probably physically with your human eyes, you literally will see the Son of Man and you literally will see a whole bunch of angels just sort of hanging around them, going up and down and around them. And it's like they're just saying, tell us what to do. Tell us what to do when he comes. Now, most likely that's the best interpretation. Now, I try my best to give you the best. And I realize that sometimes there's uh, opposing views or different thoughts or whatever. But if you look at the text and you look at the narrative there, you cannot deny 
that it's almost verbatim out of Genesis 28. Okay. So who is the bridge between earth and heaven? Jesus. Who is the one that can smash through the heavens and take you right to the heavenly father? Jesus. And that's why in prayer, you use the name of Jesus. You use the name of Jesus. And uh, just a while back, the military slammed down on the chaplains and said, you can pray, but you don't use the name of Jesus. Hmm. And that, that really shook a lot of chaplains, Christian chaplains. You can, you can have a, a prayer, a generic prayer. We don't care about that. It's just, you're not gonna do anything specific to say there's only one ladder to heaven. There's only one bridge. There's only one way. And that really, really, really went right through the whole chaplaincy of all the military branches. I know a little something about it because I actually was interviewed for a position one time. Uh, I probably would not have taken it, but I took the interview just for sort of the experience and the fun of it. <laughs> it was for a chaplaincy position and um, the commanding officer and the one who was doing the hiring, they were both on the line and they told me that. You can, you can say a prayer, but it's a, they call it a generic prayer. They don't want no brand names on it. Okay, no brand names. And I've seen a little bit of this filter its way into churches too. And I'm gonna tell you something. There's only one ladder to heaven, it's Jesus. And you better pay attention to it because he is the way, the truth, and the life. All right, so there you go. I'm preaching to you now, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm just preaching to myself and the folks here at the church and one or two online. But whoever you are, yeah, I preach a little bit to you, but that's the way it is. We're living in tough times, people. We really are. The world wants to strip away at the Bible, strip away at Bible truth, strip away at the uniqueness of Jesus. And there's no other name under heaven by which man can be saved except the name of Jesus. So we, we're going to pick it up now where we left off in our study. And I believe... We left off at verse 17, I believe, and uh, we'll, we'll pick it up at verse 18 and all the way to the end of the chapter, and then we'll conclude. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I become again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house and of all that you give me, I will surely give one tenth to you. All righty. So we're going to go back to the Hebrew word again for God. Just the just general word is El, God. Death is house. So now we're going to reverse them. Beth. L, house of God. And what does that tie into? Well, it ties into the ladder. It ties into the stone. It ties into the dream, which is an inspired dream, by the way. Holy Spirit inspired. All right? 
I'm going to try to make that real strong because you've got to watch this with the dream stuff because the world of the occult goes into it big time. And uh, it, it can be quite dangerous for people to get into that. All right. But on this particular situation, this is an inspired dream by God showing Jacob the son of man, the Lord Jesus. So the Bible does show the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. It's just hidden. It's just hidden. And that's some of the problem is that Jesus is there, but he's kind of hidden. And he's not fully revealed, but he will be fully revealed in the New Testament. Okay. So you've got this place being called Bethel. Beth, house, El, God, house of God. And Jacob will take the stone and he will consecrate that particular area with the oil. Now, oil can be used for several purposes, and one of the purposes here in the Bible in the Old Testament is consecration. He will set that site apart as holy. Okay? So just, just like we are here at a church structure in Lima, Ohio, but what I want to say is this structure has been anointed with oil by the generations of God's people who have been here. Okay, this site is set aside as a place of worship, as a Bethel, as a house of God. And um, it is sacred in, in, in our eyes, and I hope in some other folks' eyes around and I know what's happening in our world today is that people don't even regard necessarily church structures as, as sacred places anymore. But this, this stone and this ground in this area is going to be designated as a house of God. Why? Because Jacob was visited by God, you see? And if you want to go a little bit further with it, based on the Gospel of John, he actually saw Jesus, but he, he wouldn't say that. He, he couldn't say that. He, he couldn't mouth it that way. He saw a ladder and the angels ascending and descending. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus says, that was me. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, it's right there. Now, Jacob will have a response to everything. And that's how we conclude this portion of Holy Scripture with his response to everything that has happened thus far. He sets up the area as holy, but then he makes a decision to do something. And what is it that he decides to do? Look at the very last verse. The very last verse. He will tithe. Right, I will give a tithe. Now that literally means one tenth. Now I want to say this to you. Um, I might as well put it on the board too, because I like to put things on the board. So I hope you don't mind it. <laughs> Or ten. Okay, so at first we see it modeled by Abram to guess who? That strange individual that we met a while back, Melchizedek. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. 
king of shalom, king of peace, okay? Which many folks, by the way, many folks, when I say folks, I should say scholars and theologians, I'm sorry. Uh, many scholars and theologians will call that a pre-incarnate uh, Jesus Christ, Melchizedek. Not everybody agrees with that, by the way. But anyhow, Abram will decide to give one-tenth. It's not commanded. It's what he decides. Okay? So it's voluntary. At first. Then it's going to go to being commanded. And that would be in your Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Okay? Now that's going to sort of carry its way over into the new uh, Testament, but eventually it's going to be dropped. Not under law. So folks might say, well, do I have to tithe? What's the correct answer? No, you don't have to tithe. To a Christian, I'm talking Christian. You do not have to tithe. Well, how much should I give? Well, let me give you the sort of the correct answer. Give as your heart inspires you to give. <laughs> now, I know there's a lot of churches out there <laughs> that will insist that you tithe, all right? In fact, I know of a church, uh, when I was serving in Pennsylvania, it was the latest and greatest and had everything, all the programs and all the latest and all the excitement and everything and expanding facilities and all that there. And I found out that if you wanted to be a member, you were required to bring in your W-2 statements and, you, and they monitor you. Now, I'm talking about a modern church. I don't want to say name. I don't want to say domination. But no, no, no. That's incorrect. That's what? Law. Are you under law? No. You're under the spirit. So the correct answer is you give as, as led or as inspired. As God uh, leads you, or uh, leads you. I already said that. But... Or, let's put it this way. What will make you a cheerful giver? What will make you a cheerful giver? Well, I'm going to tell you one thing. Now, Market Street doesn't do this. So please, if you hear me say that's incorrect. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If Market Street said, every member, we want to see your W-2 form and we're going to monitor you. I don't think we'd have cheerful givers. <laughs> do you? Do you? No, I don't think so. You're going to come to this table and show me your W-2 statement. Now, listen, I, I, I'm serious about this. There are churches that do that now, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, you be a cheerful giver. Do I have to tithe? No. What might make me cheerful? Now, see, this, this, this is where it gets, well, maybe, just maybe, you might be cheerful if you tithe, all right? But it doesn't mean you have to. Doesn't mean you have to. Okay? Does not mean you have to. But if you want to know, kind of like well, what it, if you rephrase the question and said, what will make God cheerful? Well, you might want to say something like, well, we know from the Old Testament that he kind of liked the idea of people giving a tent. 
All right, we kind of like that because that's the way he is. Now, I didn't establish this 10th stuff. I, I only read it in the Bible. And I remember in my first church, uh, I discovered it. And I'm like, does that really? Because I didn't know much about it, to be honest with you. And uh, of course, every once in a while, in different churches where I've served, I get a little pep talk, you know, like, well, preacher, it's time for you to preach on stewardship. <laughs> and by the way, maybe you should preach on the tithe. <laughs> but you know, in all honesty, it's far better to not really push people and to let people discover it. And one of the, one of the ways that we did it in, in one of the churches I served is we just let people stand up and give testimonial about tithing. That they, they, they were the witness, not me. Not some preacher pounding the Bible at them. And it was pretty effective, by the way, just to let regular folks stand up and say, you know, I've been doing this, and I want to tell you something. It's a joy. And I want to tell you something. It's wonderful uh, in my life. So Jacob will voluntarily give a tenth. Now, like I say, it's going to move more into the law thing once we get into Moses in Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. Once they get settled in the land after Joshua. But for right now, this is all voluntary, and it came from Abram to, to Melchizedek. Now, eventually, the New Test, the Pharisees are going to pride themselves on it. The Pharisees in the New Testament are going to say, well, we tithe, and you don't. <laughs> so that makes us far better than you. Now, the Pharisees are going to do that, all right? And that's not what Jesus wanted, by the way. So eventually, by the time you get to Paul, He's going to teach you're not under law, and he's going to say, look, give from the heart. No, it doesn't have to be a tie. No, not at all. But just be a cheerful giver and want to give. And that's kind of where Paul leaves it. Like, you want to find some blessings in life? You want to find that you can really do some good in life? You'll find it in giving. Okay, so the tithe is optional uh, in New Testament. It's not law. It's not insisted on. And it is something that comes right out of the biblical text through the patriarchs, beginning with Abram. And now we see it in Jacob. I think I've said enough, and I'd like to stop here and see if I have any questions to entertain or respond to or any comments or any additions or possibly any corrections, uh, anything that I've said thus far and in particular to this last narrative here. Okay, I think what I'll do is thank you for joining us and thank you for making it to the end of the video and I'll close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge Jacob's life represents struggle and our lives at times do represent struggle as well. Help us like you helped Jacob. Let us lay our head upon a stone and see the Lord Jesus in his glory with the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Through Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.